I make a lot of these doodad boxes with scraps that I have left over that I can't do anything else with. This isn't the most epic and extravagant keepsake box that you'll ever see, but it's pretty straightforward to build and it's absolutely gift worthy. In this case, I had some cutoffs of walnut and ash, and I really liked the way those two materials contrast each other, so that's what I decided to use for this box. I start by planing the material down to 3 eighths of an inch because I found that that's about the right thickness for a box like this. The box stands about 2 and 3 eighths inch tall without the lid, so I'm going to go ahead and rip the sides to that dimension. I need to make a slot for the bottom panel to go into, so I'm going to raise the blade up. I'll just kind of eyeball on about 3 sixteenths of an inch. The slot will be about an eighth of an inch from the bottom, so I set the fence up on the table saw and start running the parts over the blade. The bottom panel is about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, so I just tap the fence over just a little bit and start running the parts through again to open the slot up just a little bit more. And here you can see how the bottom panel fits perfectly into the slot. I like to sand the parts before I do the final assembly. It's a little bit easier to do it at this point and it does save a little bit of time. This box has mitered corners so I'm going to use a sled to make those cuts on the table saw. I'm doing the long end first and they're 10 inches so I have a stop set up on the sled. When I make cuts like this I always stand to the side because of that right there. Take another look and see if it goes into the trash can almost. These miters are really nice. Once you start doing miters on a table saw you'll never want to do them any other way again. The short end of the box is six inches so I have the stop set up and I'm going to go ahead and clamp the material on the fence for these cuts. Once I get it clamped I give it a quick look to make sure the clamp won't interfere with the blade and then I go ahead and make the next cut. And once again, this is why I stand to the side when I make these kinds of cuts. For the bottom panel, I'm using flooring underlayment. You can buy this at any of the big box stores. I always keep some on hand because it's the perfect thickness. It usually has a pretty nice finish and it just looks really good in these boxes. With all the parts cut, I give it a quick dry fit just to make sure everything lines up and, and looks good and I feel good about it before I move on to actually gluing the parts together. These are the little hinges that I use on these boxes. They're the perfect size and they're pretty cheap. So I'm going to lay it out. I'm going to move in about an inch and a half from each end. And then I'm going to mark where the hinges are going to go. I use the table saw with the sled and slot out all the way across that span for these hinges. Then I move the part to the center of the blade and just slowly move it across to clean it up. And this is another view of the same process. These slots look good and they'll be the perfect fit for those hinges. By now everyone has seen this technique and I'm going to use it here too. I'm going to use painter's tape and what this will do will allow me to get good alignment on these mitered corners and it'll hold these corners in place while the glue dries.
I need about 20 minutes for the glue to set up and dry before I take the tape off. So while that's taking place, I start working on the top. I have a piece of ash, and luckily that piece of ash was really flat, so I didn't have to join it or anything like that. I get it planed down to about 3 eighths like all the other parts. Then I go ahead and pre-sand it as well. Although they weren't too bad, I did have some gaps in a couple of these mitered corners. So I'm going to use this Timbermate wood filler to fill up any voids and hide any imperfections. This kind of imperfection will disappear with a little bit of sanding and rounding over these edges. And now for the real test, when I pull a tape from corner to corner, am I square? Perfect. Because the box is square, it makes cutting the top really easy. I just go ahead and rip it to 10 by 6. I use a self-centering drill bit to drill pilot holes for the hinge screws. And with those installed, I'm ready to go ahead and attach the lid. These are just little pieces of cardboard and I'm going to use them to temporarily shim up the hinge. This is the technique that I use to attach a lid to a box. I use 5 minute epoxy so that I can temporarily hold the lid in place. That way I can locate the placement of the hinge screws. The cardboard shim that I put in earlier also keeps me from gluing the hinge together. With the epoxy I have time to locate the placement that I want. Then I put something heavy on it and let it set up. Now I can very gently open the lid, the hinges will stay in place, and I'll know exactly where to drill for the hinge screws. I typically use a different brand of 5 minute epoxy, and I wasn't a big fan of this Gorilla Glue. It seemed like it was kind of spongy, and I didn't have a whole lot of confidence that it was going to hold the lid in place. In spite of the gnashing of teeth, I was able to get the lid on. It lined up perfectly and it looked really good. I used acetone to wipe around the hinges to clean up any remnants of the epoxy. One more quick sanding and then it will be ready for a top coat. I just used crackle can lacquer for the top coat, but it really brought this box to life. This box is fast, easy, and straightforward to make. And once you get good at making a box like this, you can start dressing it up with splines and other cool features. But this simple little box is absolutely worthy of giving as a gift, and it's fun to make. I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something, but more importantly, I hope you got some of your own ideas. Be sure to give me a thumbs up, leave me some comments, and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.